thank you for coming over to the library for our first lunch in the uh, Thank you for coming to our lunch in the library, uh, first lunch in the library presentation for the academic year. Um, just want to make a quick reminder, if you have a cell phone, please turn it on vibrate or turn it off. Thank you. So uh, I guess we'll just jump right in. Uh, again, a reminder, if you haven't signed up to win the Frame Rosie the Riveter um, poster, which is a lot like that, it's not that, but it's a lot like that. As you saw when you first come walk in, in you can do that right now. Um, just sign up at the desk, and we'll have a drawing right afterwards. So, all right. Um, let me introduce Teresa Bachman. She'll be portraying Gladys the Riveter. And Teresa is a fifth-generation Butler Countyan who has always been deeply curious about the past. As director of the Butler County Historical Center and Ken's Oil Museum, her job suits her perfectly and tends to feed this interest in history. This portrayal is her real-life Aunt Gladys on the floor of a hangar at Boeing Airplane Company in Wichita, Kansas. She is addressing another group of new hires, which is all of you. <laughs> the date is 19, March 1945. The Germans have been pushed back to, Ber to Berlin, and the focus is now on winning the war in the Pacific against the Emperor of Japan and his forces. Let's join Gladys the Riveter. checklist of things that we need to go over. First off is your training. You'll be training to be riveters and buckers. Now the riveters use this gun that you just saw me using. It drives the rivets through a hole in the airplane and then the bucker is on the inside and she holds up a metal bar about this big and then the rivet splays out and holds the planes together. There are over 90,000 rivets in a B-29 airplane. So you're going to have lots of practice. But first you're going to get training down at Swallow Airplane Company, downtown Wichita, four weeks. I want you to listen up. I want you to learn. I want you to come back here ready to go to work on the line. Now we have some safety features. You have to keep your hair up, ladies. If your hair gets caught in some of this equipment, it can scalp you. We had a girl just a few weeks ago over in another hangar that got her hair caught and it scalped her. Not only did she go through terrible pain, but the training that we put into her and the time she could be spending here making these airplanes to win the war, it's gone. So safety is a big issue. No bracelets, no watches, no earrings, and no rings. Now I know you girls that have husbands overseas as soldiers, you don't want to take that ring off. So I suggest that you put it on a chain around your neck and carry it down inside your blouse where you'll still have it, but you won't lose a finger, and that's what can happen. Very important. No heels, girls. This isn't a place for heels. Get you some old loafers or get some boots like I found. And it's getting a little more friendly out there for people shopping for women to work in these big defense plants. Now, I don't know about you, but after going through the 30s and the Depression days, and I had patches on patches on my clothes because we couldn't afford any more clothes, I like my nice clothes that my Boeing paycheck can now pay for, and I don't want to come out here and ruin them. There's a fine, sharp edge on this metal. There's a, a real fine grease or oil on the metal and it can ruin your clothes. So you can get your pair of these coveralls. Now these were men's and I did a little tucking here and there sewing. 
but uh, they protect your clothes. I can walk in, and put these on, and go right to work. Now, I know that they don't make you look like a movie star, like Rita Hayworth or anything like that, but they do protect your clothing. Very important. Okay. Now, I can see some real fear on your faces, ladies. This is probably the first time that you've come out of your home to work anywhere, let alone a big noisy factory. You're stepping into some place that you never would have dreamed of a few years ago. You all know why you're here? Our men have marched off to war to fight the axis of evil. Japan, Germany, and Italy. Now we've got the, the uh, Nazis pushed back into Berlin and we're going to defeat them soon. We're concentrating on the Pacific Theater and the Imperial Japanese Army. And these big, beautiful planes are going to win the war in the Pacific. And you are all going to be part of it. You are going to be so proud every day to walk in here and build these planes. We are building three to four of these planes every day, girls. A lot of riveting. A lot of riveting. And your arms going to be tired and your shoulders are going to hurt. And you're going to think, I just can't do another day. It just... It just hurts too bad. Well, the day you don't come to work is the day the enemy wins. You must be here, on the line, working, building the B-29s. Freedom depends on it. The freedom of the world. Let me give you just a, a little background on myself. I'm a farmer's daughter from Butler County, the oldest of six children. And I was so shy that I begged my mother not to make me go back to school in my junior year of high school. And she said, that would be all right. So I stayed home, helped her with the other children, and things were just fine until the depression, the drought. Now my father, he is a talented man. He has his own dark room, does his own film development, is a talented photographer. He likes to work with the flowers in the yard and he pollinates and tries different flowers. The one thing that he <coughs> doesn't do well is farming. And we've had some lean years. So when the drought hit, we had some even leaner years. We couldn't feed all those spaces around the table. So I got a job. I worked for a neighbor family as a domestic. I did the cleaning, I did the laundry, I did cooking, shopping if I was needed. And I had a roof over my head and I had food on the table. And then December 7th, 1941, our president Franklin Delano Roosevelt said that it was a day that would live in infamy. The Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor and killed over 2,000 of our young sailors. So, will we ever forget that day? The next day, Congress declared war on Japan. Then Germany declared war on us. And Italy was right behind them, of course. I was working for a family here in Wichita at that time as a domestic. 
I was making $60 a month. Not bad for unskilled labor and not even a high school diploma. I started seeing ads in the Wichita Beacon. Well, in fact, I have one here on the back of my clipboard. Wanted women to be trained to do important war work. Wages paid while training, no experience necessary, permanent work, an excellent opportunity <coughs> for advancement. Well, I called my sister, who was teaching in a one-room schoolhouse over in Butler County, and I said, let's go out to Boeing and see if they'll hire us. She said, well, she'd have to wait till the end of the semester. So in December, we did go out, we applied, and we both got hired. She, at first, was offered a job because she's so tiny, little redhead, this big, they wanted her to go out in the very tips of the wings and do the work. And she said, no, thank you. So they hired her up in the offices. And she's up in, in the personnel office right now. And they hired me as a riveter. Well, don't tell her, but I do make a little bit better money than she does in the office. I was trained to be a riveter. Now they're going to call you Rosie, Rosie the Riveter, but be proud of it, girls. Be proud, because you are here. This is your victory work, and we will win this war, because you have sacrificed, because you have laid down your spoon at home and come out of your kitchen to learn to do work in these defense plans. Now I know that you've probably all read the story about Elgin Staples, the seaman whose ship was sunk over in the Pacific, and he floated to safety wearing a, a life jacket that had been inspected, stamped, and packed by his own mother in Akron, Ohio. What were the chances of the thousands of life jackets that she'd handled that week, one of them would save her own son's life? What were the chances that her coming to work every day would be so important to her? So I want you all to be thinking every rivet that you put in this big plane is another railroad blown up over in Japan. It's another factory gone in Japan. It's more roads gone in Japan so that they cannot war against us anymore. So that our troops, our young men can come home. Now you think you have it tough? They're over there in muddy foxholes. They are dying they are being wounded. So I want you here, and I want you determined, and we will win. Now, this is serious talk, but we also have a great time. Housework. You do the laundry, laundry gets dirty, you do the laundry. You clean the house, it gets dirty, you clean the house. You do the dishes, you make another meal. There's more dirty dishes. And for many of us, there's no other adult in the house most of the day to talk to. And out here, we have each other. We're making friendships that will last a lifetime. We sit around in groups during our lunch break and we talk and talk and talk and we laugh, we also have a great time out here. And it's so important. Something that the men never told us, girls, that you can take a tool like this in your hand and build something so significant 
and what a satisfaction that gives you. That you can stand at the end of the tarmac and watch these planes fly off that you were just working on hours before. And to know that that means freedom. Now, I hope that most of you have housing. Housing has been a big problem. With the airplane companies out here, we've had thousands and thousands of people pour into Wichita from all over the country for jobs. Uh, my sister and I right now have rented a room from a couple, and that consists of a bed and a hot plate, and uh, we're, we're getting along fine with that. They have built a new federal housing just south here of Boeing. It's called Plainview. Cute name. And they have a waiting list. If you want to get on the list to get into those nice new houses, now they are small, but they have sort of a, a central building that has laundry. They have a child care thing there for you. And it's, it's all women that work out here at Boeing. They have uh, lists up in personnel if you'd like to go up there and look at the lists on what there is to rent, get your name down. That's important. You mothers that have children at home, we don't want you out here working on planes worried about your children at home. And I have heard that there are very young children being left at home so their mothers can come to the defense plants to work. We don't want that because we know your mind will not be fully on your job. And that can mean mistakes. It can mean accidents. So the local high school girls, the local 4-H girls, as part of their victory work, they are actually babysitting for the women that work out here at the plants for free. There's a list of those up in personnel. Please go get those so your children will be taken care of. And there's also a new federal child care program where they have uh, care centers for the children. You take them in, they feed them a nice hot meal at noon, and uh, you, can, you can pick them up after you're done working. Now some other things. The Wichita Public Library has a bookmobile that comes down at the gate for every shift change. You can check your books in, you can check books out. It saves you a lot of time. If you're working six days a week out here, 10 hours a day, you will not have a lot of spare time, especially you that are mothers. So something like this really is important to save you time. The, all of the businesses in town are open 24 hours a day. The ships out here are 24 hours a day. So in order to help the workers, you can go get groceries at midnight. You can go to the bowling alley if you need a little recreation at 2 a.m. So the, the downtown businesses have been very supportive. We also have what they call the, uh, the victory hour. And after the downtown businessmen have, uh, like the offices have closed at five, they come out here and they work in the plants for two or three hours as part of their war effort. So that's When the war started, the government looked around and said, all of our men are going off to be soldiers. Who are going to be in the factories building the planes? Who are going to sew up the uniforms? Who are going to make the tanks? Where will we get this labor force? And they looked across the country and they saw women. Now they had to convince us to come out of our homes and work in these big noisy factories. They had to convince the companies to hire us, and they had to convince the men to work alongside us and train us. 
Now some of the men weren't too nice when we first came out here. They did little dirty tricks. <coughs> they did talk crude language to us. And we had to prove to them that we could do this job. We had to prove to them that we could build B-29 airplanes. So we worked twice as hard, twice as fast, and we proved to ourselves too. I wasn't sure when I came out here that I could do this job. And it's given me confidence to stand in front of you, which I never could have done before all this. And I hope it's giving me skills that I can use the rest of my life. Skills that I can earn a good wage. I'm single. I don't have a husband. I have to make my own way in this world. I'm making, don't tell anybody, I'm making 95 cents an hour. It's a good wage. It's a good job. It's hard work. But it's, it is so worth it. It is so worth it. There's a story going around in one of the plants where uh, <coughs> there was one particular gentleman, gentleman, maybe I shouldn't use that word, one of the men, he just kept bothering these two young girls that had come right out of high school, came right out here to work, and he would sit on the wing that they were trying to live it. And he'd cross his arms, he'd say, well, girls, you're not getting your work done, I'm going to have to report you, and he'd be sitting right where they needed to be working. So the one girl had a drill and a drill bit about this long, and she was underneath the wing, and she told the, the other girl, she said, next time he does this, don't say anything. Just, you know, just step back and let him sit there. So sure enough, the next day or two, he comes along and sits down on the wing, and the girl underneath drills right up into his rear. He jumped off in a hurry and hasn't bothered them since. <laughs> now, I don't recommend that. But if you have any trouble with any of the fellows out here, you come to me. I've grown to know them all quite well right through here. I have uh, people that find out I'm working over here at Boeing, and they say, oh, my cousin works over there. Do you know so-and-so? Well, I have to smile because there's 30,000 people working out here. That's three times the size of El Dorado, where I come from. No, I haven't met their cousin. This is like a big city. The population has exploded for the world effort. Now, let's talk a little bit about the plane. I keep picking this up, but don't need it. Okay. I have a box of rivets here, and depending on where you're riveting on the plane, it depends on what the metal is and what the size is. But it's just got kind of a little rounded edge, and that head fits right into the rivet gun. There's a half inch, there's a hole driven, drilled every half inch all over the plane. Now it's called a stretched skin construction, and all that means is that it has the ribs of the plane or the frame and then the thin metal over that, then we drill a hole every half inch and a rivet goes in there. And I already explained to you how the bucker works, how the rivet gun works. The fuselage, which, sorry, I'm using plane terms here, that's the body of the plane, 99 feet long. The wings are 145 feet long. Now, the wings won't go on until we actually get it out of the hangar. We're working here on the nose where the, where the pilot sits. Carries uh, up to a crew of 10. And it has a pressurized cabin. Now, what that means is that they actually have oxygen for the men 
to use so they can go way up higher than any plane, 30,000 feet high. The B-29 flies faster, flies farther. It's called the Super Fortress. It can carry a 10-ton load of bombs. It has eight turrets for machine guns. And it is beautiful when it flies off the end of the runway. You can be so proud of yourself. Your children and your grandchildren will be proud of you. What they call the home front effort here in America is what has saved this world, what has helped us to win this war. Our efforts at recycling. A lipstick, it takes 40 lipstick tubes to make one shell. All that paper that you saved, all that metal, all that grease for the ammunition. This country has come together in an amazing way to fight the evil that has tried to overtake us. Like I said, I hope that I can go out of this job. I know the young men will come back, the soldiers will be coming back and need jobs. But I'm hoping that I will be able to keep my job here or some at another plant where I can keep using my skills, be productive, help support myself and my aging parents. You're part of history, ladies. I want you to remember that. I want you to tell your children about the experiences you had out here during the war. Now Johnson is your guide there. She's going to take you around the hangar and show you where everything is. We have some lockers over here that you can lock up your purses. There's a lunch room over on the other side. You can bring a lunch or there is a hot canteen wagon. Now, never mind that they call it the Roach Coach. It's really pretty good food. You can go out to the gate and get you some hot food for your, for your meals. And I want you all to be here in four weeks, ready to go, ready to build these B-29 airplanes, and ready to be part of the winning war effort. Wilma, you ready to get to work again?